A big hello and good evening and welcome to Manchester. Uh, we are live for MMTV, live from Marlet Mancunia Studios. I'm Dave Sweetmore. It is great to have your company as always. And for the next hour or so, we've got a top night of entertainment coming up for you. Uh, don't forget, we're live from Manchester. It is rock and roll television at its finest. So if you are watching this live, wherever you are in the world, or you're watching it again on our YouTube channel, please do be aware there may be a little bit of effing and jeffing if the kids are about. We're live on MMTV. Uh, we are live on music magazine site, Jamazine as well. So big hello to everyone who's watching all around the world on Jamazine. And of course, at MMTV, we are live here in association with High Violet PR and Plugin. So big thank you to Sean and the team at High Violet PR and Plugin for helping us put this amazing show together. Uh, tonight, live on the show a little bit later on, we've got live music from Suave Martyrs and the brilliant M40. Uh, Hyde Boxer, Stacey Copeland is going to be live in the studio. We're going to be having a chat to her. Uh, we've got spoken word tonight with Anton. And our very, very special guest tonight is the legend that is Gary Daly from China Crisis. He's going to be on a little bit later on. But you are watching MMTV live from Manchester. To start the show tonight, you're going to love these. This is Ruins. This one's called Last Nail.
MMTV, let's hear it from Manchester, that is Ruins. Okay, you are watching MMTV live from Manchester, rock and roll television at its finest. We're all around the world on MMTV and on Jamazine as well. Uh, and don't forget, we are here in association with High Violet PR and Plugin. Uh, we've got loads more top line music on the way for you a little bit later on, but it is time we introduce you to our sporting hero from Hyde. Please welcome Stacey Copeland. How are you, Stacey? Come and join us. Sit down. How's it going? All right. Just good, give you that. Thanks. Cheers. Good. Right. Now, obviously, you're here. You've come from Hyde. We're going to talk about your boxing career in a minute. But let's start back at the beginning. It wasn't all about boxing, was it? As a child, you got into football first, didn't you? Um, I actually did boxing first. Like My granddad ran our boxing gym and my dad was a boxer. So me and my dad spent most of my childhood sparring and watching Rocky and stuff. And um, yeah, then I, w I went into the boxing gym, absolutely loved everything about it, um, but couldn't box because back then it was, uh, it was against the law, it was legal for girls. So because I couldn't go into that and I loved footy as well, I ended up playing football for many years. So for your footballing career, you played for Doncaster Bells and you were also, uh, you were also called up to the England under 18s as well. What was that like, you know, going from wanting to be into boxing, but you know, obviously you had 
a good talent at football. What were it like playing for Doncaster Bells and then England under 18s? It was just amazing. I'd always wanted to play for Donny Bells because they're pretty much the only team you ever that were visible really as a kid watching women's footy. And uh, there was three things I really wanted to do. I wanted to play an FA Cup final, play for England, and play abroad. And I was dead fortunate. I got to. I got to do all of them because I got to play in America and Brazil and Sweden and just what an amazing experience, really. It's dead right what you're saying, really, because obviously women's football at the moment is massive, but Doncaster Bells were the first ones, really, weren't they? You know what I mean? They were the ones that would kind of like put it in the limelight. So how long did you play football for? What, what age did you get to playing football? Um, well, I started as, as a little kid, but I signed my first Premier League contract with uh, Tranmere Rovers when I was 15. Um, and then I finished playing when I was 29. And by then, boxing was legal for girls and women. Uh, there was a national championship. There was talk of it coming into the Olympics. So I'd never lost that hunger and desire to, to do it. I'd never been out of boxing. Um, it's very much part of my family and part of my life. And I thought, right, now's, now's my chance. And, you know, from being a little kid, I used to, like, cut a slice off a cucumber and mould my own gum shield and be running around the kitchen, like, thinking I was a world champion. Never, ever thought I'd actually get to do it. And then there I was you know, a few years later, making my pro debut. And best thing of all, it was in my home city of Manchester, all, all my friends and family. It's true that, it's brilliant. You went from football, obviously, you went into boxing. You turned pro at the age of 36, which in the nicest way possible is quite, it's not a young age to start, that, is it, 36? When you realised that you were going to become pro at that age, did you have any fear that, you know, a lot of your opponents were going to be younger or anything like that? Or were it like, I'm Stacey Copeland, we're having it? No, I'm like a good wine. Just get a bit better with age. I think obviously people, you know, people's reflexes and stuff's better when they're younger. But I think when you're older in sports, sometimes as long as you manage your body right, you know, eventually it breaks down. But mentally, what you've been through and what you've learned and your resilience is uh, is that much better. So um, I, I didn't have any fears about it. And to be honest, it comes to a point when it's that big. Some dreams are that big that the, the drive to accomplish it and do it, it outweighs any fears and doubts that you can have. I didn't realise it was so recent that you know, female boxing became legal kind of thing. When you went from being football, you know, from football to boxing, your family at that point must have been really, really, you know, even though they were proud of you for football, but obviously, like you say, boxing, you've been brought up with, so it must have been a special moment for them as well. I don't think my dad was too sure at first. So I got back from, I've been away my whole sweat is like playing football all over the place. And when I got back, he said, right, you're going to settle down now. And I was like, what are you on about? And he said, uh, well, you know, settle. And, and I said, no, no, I want a box. And he kind of didn't say anything. Then he rang me a couple of days. We met up on Dean's Gate and went for dinner. And then he rang me a couple of days later and he went, right, I've had to think. And, you know, if you want to do it, then all right. And I went, oh, I wasn't asking you, Dad. <laughs> I was telling you that's what's happening. And I'll kick so your head if you don't <laughs> Yeah. So uh, he, he was my coach as an amateur. And what a fantastic experience as father and daughter that we had, travelling all over the place together as, as coach and boxer as well. And then when I won the ABA title, that meant me and my dad were the first father and daughter to both win ABA titles. So it was a pretty special one for us. I was just going to talk about that in July last year your fifth pro fight you went to Zimbabwe where you became the first Brit to win the Commonwealth super title at that age that must have been pretty special is that something you knew you could achieve yeah I just I just completely believed in myself like I say you know you do have fears as a boxer it's a it's a it's a it's, it is a scary thing you, it was natural as a human being to be frightened of going into a fight with someone that's planned weeks ahead usually it's just a quick thing and before you know it there's a kebab on your head and you're having a scrap in the street for normally but Boxers, you weeks ahead, you're planning it. Union, you're <laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> All right, the chippy then sound a bit posher outside. You know, a, a, a restaurant with caviar on your face, but yeah, it was, um, it was, it, it, yeah, it's nerve wracking. But again, I think because I, I know why I'm doing it, I want to inspire other people, particularly what I pave the way for the next generation of girls and women coming through in the sport. You know, I want, I, I want to push things in. The, the most important thing about that ended up being, I mean, it was massive over there. There was 100 million people watched it because it was on their free sports channel across the continent. Um, obviously, making history, there was a big pressure, but I knew why I was doing it because I wanted to inspire and pave the way. And you've got to step up when those moments come. Um, and there wasn't a belt after it. That, that was the, the hard thing. And um, when I spoke, I got back on the Monday from Zimbabwe and spoke to the head of the Commonwealth Boxing Council. And he said that um, there wasn't a belt because the manufacturers of the replica belts had stopped producing them. I said, what's that got to do with me? He said, well, we do replica belts for women and real belts for men. I said, right, okay. So I said, why is that? So it's still stuck in the past. Yeah, yeah. And then he said, oh, well, there's more money in men's boxing. I said, I know, but if there weren't going to be a belt, you should have given me that option. If it meant paying with it for my own money, I'd have done it. Because to be honest, the worst thing wasn't straight after the fight, not having the belt in the ring. The worst bit was getting back to Manchester Airport. And I hadn't told anybody that I didn't have a belt. I didn't want to put a downer on it. Everyone was buzzing, like, bring the belt. Bring the... People and I... would have presumed, wouldn't Yeah, they? and I got to the airport 
everybody had come as a surprise, like loads of my mates, loads of my family. I didn't have the belt and that was a bad feeling. But so I said to him, right, what's done's done. How quickly can I have a real belt? And he said, well, they're expensive. So unless you've got a sugar daddy, you probably won't be able to have one. And it's difficult to put into words really how that, how that feels when somebody, you know, speaks to you like that. But, you know, although it was a bad experience, I was the right person for it to happen to because, you know, I'm of that age now where I will speak up and use my voice and challenge stuff. And now there is a Commonwealth title belt for women. So thank you. Because so, Stacey Copeland. So I so forgot the belt. I forgot to bring it. I meant to bring it. it. it's <laughs> I totally forgot to bring it. I was in a rush. I want to talk about the last 12 months since that fight in a few minutes. But first of all, you've had a pretty special career from being a young girl uh, through the Donny Bells, through the England under 18 to football. I'm going to ask you a dead hard question now. What would you say your highlight of your sporting career is? Um, winning the European silver medal in the amateurs because I can't begin to tell you what that felt like standing on that podium with a medal around my neck watching my country's flag be raised when I was banned from the sport as a kid and I remember being like as an 11 year old when you usually get to do skills bouts and that and saying to my granddad I'd done everything that my little lad mates did in the gym so I just assumed I'd box them and I was like right granddad you know I can get carded now and he was like you can't box kid and I went, what are you on about? And he said, oh, it's not allowed for girls. It's illegal. I couldn't believe it. So to have that moment of not only boxing for my country, but to win a medal and, like I say, just be part of that ceremony was just, I can't even put that into words. So it was just an amazing feeling. It's quite some story, that, and you really, really did make history. So that was July last year, your fifth you know, professional fight, Zimbabwe, first ever Brit to win the Commonwealth Superweight title. After that fight, though, injury struck. What happened? I had to have um, my tendon in my hand repaired because she, I mean, she was a proper unit and she had a dead hard head. So, <laughs> <Proper> <laughs> unit. Yeah. so it's, it knackered my hand, so I had to have my tendon repaired. And then uh, I was just in my third spa back in January because you can't punch for three months after that. So we'd done everything one handed and kept training. It was going well. Third spa back and I got a, a cartilage problem with my knee, which is really that's old footage just ruins your knees, doesn't it? So, uh, I've, yeah, the last few months have probably tested me physically, mentally, emotionally, every way, because anyone who's done sport or anything that they, you know that's their identity and their purpose, if it gets taken away from me, it's it's difficult. But you know, I know why I'm doing it. I'm going to stay. You know, I'm determined to have. I really want a world title fight in Manchester because it was great fighting in Zimbabwe. Don't get me wrong; it was an absolute dream. But I want to do one here for the people who followed me from the beginning. It's great that even with your injury, you're continuing to be that determined and that focused. So, what's the future hold? Where are you up to now with it all? Um, well, in terms of boxing, I'm still, that's my main focus, is, is getting a world title fight in Manchester. Outside of that, I work in a school three days a week at Parswood in like Burnage, Didsbury. Um, and also, I've just set, I do a lot of public speaking, which I love. It's a real privilege. And then also, I've just um, submitted my charity, Pave the Way, to the Charity Commission. So that's about gender equality for both boys and girls, because I know and I truly believe that talent's um, universally distributed, but opportunity isn't. Uh, and that's if you're a Has boy. You've proven in your life. Yeah, and that's it. And you know, we're working with a, a young lad at the minute who's a, a top, top ballet dancer in the country, and his story is exactly like mine in terms of stigma that he's faced, but the other way around. And it's just not right. It's we can all have a laugh about stuff, but when you think about taking away the thing that makes him the human being that he is, that's like taking boxing off me. You know, when you think about the amount of people that haven't had these opportunities to have the life they want and follow the passions. You know, whether you're a boy or a girl, you should be able to do what you love, do what you enjoy, do what you're passionate about and not be limited by these daft gender stereotypes. We need to get rid of them. Many girls. Yeah. Many girls your age as a kid would have heard that about boxing and then thought, look, it ain't happening, do you know what I mean? But yet you continue to be determined and do what you do, which is obviously a massive inspiration to many. And I think anyone watching this on MMTV or on Jamazine will be listening, thinking, you know, that's an inspirational person. It'll be 50 year olds now, like, where's my gloves? <laughs> Get my gloves out. <laughs> if anyone wants any more information about the talks that you do, or about, you know, that you're thinking, when can we see Stacey fight next, anything like that? Is there anywhere they can go to look at the work you do? Yeah, they can just follow me on social media. It's just uh, Twitter's S Copeland Boxer. Instagram, Stacey Copeland Boxer, and I just, I'm just dead privileged that I get, get to do this and that I've found my purpose, really, like, like everybody here, whether it's music, whether it's the, whatever it is, you're just lucky, aren't you, if you get to do what you love, and the amount of parents that I hear from, both who've got boys and girls, who were saying that it's making a difference, and that, that's what matters to me, really. Titles are nice, but it's what you can do. Sport's one of the most powerful things on the planet for making a difference, making positive change, and I'm just lucky that I love that and not some rubbish like maths. You say we're lucky to 
you say you say we're lucky to do what we do, but we're lucky to have you here. Such an inspirational person that you know anyone watching this, it could be changing kids' lives. Thinking, hang on a minute, she did it, I can do it, and we're in a much more like you say universal world now yeah. where things are more accepted. So listen, we can't thank you enough for joining us on MMTV tonight. What an inspiration! Let's hear it, Stacey Copeland. Yeah. Stacey Copeland, everybody, an absolute inspiration from Hyde, boxer, footballer, and now inspirational speaker as well. Uh, you are watching MMTV Live. We are live from Marlin Mancunia Studio in Manchester. A little bit later on, we've got the brilliant M40. We've got Gary Daly from China Crisis. We've got Anton doing a little bit of spoken word. Uh, but now it is time for some more live music. We think they're ready. MMTV in association oh, with High Violet PR and plugging live around the world on MMTV and Jamazine. Please welcome one of our favourite bands. Let's hear it for M40. Come on, nice one, Dave. Big respect to Dave Sweetmore, Anton, everybody. Hey, hiya, man. <laughs> um, let's have it. Manchester, how are you feeling? You're all good. Nice one. Thanks for having us down here, you know what I mean? Um, we're M40 Manchester, like the postcode, you know what I mean? Um, first tune that we're going to be pulling out is going to be a tune called Who's To Say? And yeah, I hope it rocks your head and I hope you enjoy it. Let's have a bit of this. Fucking like a sardine up here. Yeah, yeah. Let's go. <laughs> Yeah. 
Come on. Cheers, guys. Nice one. Sorry, mate. I'm knocking him out of tune all over the gap with my elbow, my shoulder, my knees, my toes. Anyway, yeah, thank you. Um, big respect. Top one. What we're doing next? What we're going to throw out? Falling, yeah. Well, this is our single. Uh, you probably heard it a million and fucking three times because we played it everywhere. Thanks to Davey. Smashed it as well. Big respect on 96 point whatever it is. Got it. But it was on Rev. It was on fucking Rev. This is falling. TV live from Manchester. There's a reason why they're everywhere at the moment, and that's it. A big round of applause for M40. <laughs> Cheers, lads. Uh, okay, you are watching MMTV. We are live from Manchester. Don't forget, wherever you're watching this, make sure you share it. It's rock and roll TV at its finest all around the world on MMTV and Jamazine in association with High Violet PR and Plugin. Uh, we've got some more live music in a bit with Suave Martyrs. We've got the legendary Gary Daly from China Crisis. But now it is time for our spoken word section of the show, MMTV. We'd like to welcome up, uh, making his debut on the show, uh, Anson, to do some spoken word. Let's hear a big round of applause for Anson. Can you hear me? Yeah, right, sweet. Right, anyway, all those that know me, they've been taking pictures out the back because I'm proper nervous. I'm usually on the other side of the camera in this sort of shit. But tonight, I'm going to come up. I haven't felt fucking this nervous about being up since I watched Brokeback Mountain. Anyway. Anyway, anyway, special thanks to our sponsor tonight, Fred Perry, the biggest brand to come out of Stockport since Manchester City. 
minute, one minute, because I'm not like them proper poets like Carl Hildebrandt, the twat, who has a notebook. I'm up to date. They have a bit of technology. So anyway, I have to read it because I've got a memory of a fish. So this first one, all right, I've got going to do two for you tonight, right? This first one's called Shameside. It's about growing up in Tameside or the inner suburbs of Manchester in the late 80s or early 90s, being a kid around Hyde and areas like that. You're all the late Stacey. You're from Hyde, are you? Right, right, so you all know all this. I'm from Newton, so that's how I know. Uh, I know, yeah, I can't help it. <laughs> right, anyway, so, shush, everyone. This is really important to me. I've never done this shit before. <laughs> right, are you ready? Right, anyway, we'd walk to school, avoiding the glue sniffers, sucking bags in doorways. They'd give us some shivers. My mum, she'd always say, stay away. Son, I can't be arsed driving you. Will you just go the long way? <laughs> and we all had a good graffitied hold all that was made by a company called Head until one of your best mates said, that logo is an upside down tit, you dickhead. And we did play and record to get new tunes from the TV. And remember every household who listened to Key 103. And we had a pop man, a fish man, a video man, a lone man, even a sunbed man. He'd drop off a bed with red goggles and your nan would get a tan. <laughs> and remember what he called your milkman? He called him Ernie. That's what we called him on our streets. He was a legend. He was fast on his feet. Fucking had to be. <laughs> <laughs> and on Fridays, we drink three litres of cider in the den that we made and gave a name. There was no FIFA 90. British Bulldogs was our game. And we all knew our phone box number because they were our phones. If it wasn't for you, you'd get a door knock, not one of them ringtones. And our PE teacher... He hid the fact that he was gay, but his pink shell suit and his blonde moustache gave him away. <laughs> but he's come out now. I'm quite glad, because that's okay. <laughs> and remember CB radios? Our handles all ended in posse. The local dealer was an expelled kid from the top block called Mossy. He'd sell his teens in fibres to the kids that were skivers and double dip strawberry LSD. If you bought two, he'd give you one free. And we put 50p in our tellies from Radio Rental. When it ran out, there was no need to go mental. Because we knew how to open that little box, remember, with a pen or a pencil. And our electric meters took tickets that were little paper cards. You could cover them in tipex just for a few extra yards. And remember, grot bags? Rent a ghost. No wonder we're fucking cranks. <laughs> Ringo Starr wasn't a drummer back then. He was Thomas the Tank. And our DJs played their sets on final, on vinyl, 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 vinyl. And our noisy neighbours were never in finals. We'd eat marathons, not Snickers. On our feet, we wore feel of boots or kickers. But our memories, they were all made of laughs. No wasted time taking photographs. But it's a different world that the kids live in today. But I'll always be grateful we grew up with nothing, but we grew up in this way. Right, that one? You all right? I'm getting booed off yet, what? Right, right, I've got one. I've got one more, and then I'm going to fuck off and leave you all to it, right? This one's about MMTV, because we started this show a year ago, so this is an old to MMTV. It's Rope for Luck, and it's written by me. All right. So it's been a year since Neck and I s had an idea for a show. It's raw, it's live, and it kind of goes with the flow. But to me, what makes you so, so brill are the bands that come here and give us a thrill. And sporting stars of old to ones at the top of their game, from our unsung community heroes to our city's big name, and to our crew, our sound man, Kieran Lee. We'll spot him running around like he needs a wee. <laughs> <laughs> and to our host, Dave, he's one cool cat. Ignore that proper poet, remember him, who called him a twat. <laughs> the only thing on this show without any flaws is our host, Mr. Dave Sweetmore. And where would we be without our G? She's our queen of MMTV, and our photos don't recapture what we want to see. And Kai's a guy who mans our camera. You'll find him out the back smoking ganja. <laughs> and to our fat neck, the master at being our top caster, he gets your guests like Sean Ryder, and he sometimes gets him here without any fucking minor. <laughs> and our regulars, too many to mention, but Linda, Ray, Mandy, that 219 bus to Stockport fucking comes in handy. And if there was one future guest that we could pick, that's our holy grail over there, King Eric. So thanks to all the guests, bands, fans, 
Do us a favour, will you? Go and fucking buy some cans. MMTV, live from Manchester, making his spoken word debut. Let's hear it for Anson. And as Anson did just mention, we are coming up to one years old. So our next show, which is going to be in two weeks' time, is going to be a special, special show, as it will be the first anniversary of the MMTV. So once again, we're live from Manchester on Jamazine and on MMTV with High Violet PR and Plugin. Our next guest is a gentleman who, over the years, has created seven studio albums with his band, as well as 20 singles. They've been going for 40 years. Please welcome up to the MMTV stage from China Crisis, the one and only Gary Daly. <laughs> How's it going, man? Yes, sound. Good. Really Cheers good. for taking the time out to join us. I know you must have done millions of these over the years, but this is real, isn't it? This is proper. Uh, I have done a lot, but I've never done this. In in uh, Manchester, oh, fucking hell, Manchester. <laughs> well, speaking of Manchester, let's go back to the beginning. I yeah. want, obviously, you've got a new album out this year, which I'm going to talk about, yeah. you know, shortly. But I want to go through your career in ten minutes, if that's possible. Yeah, yeah. You were formed forty years ago, 1979, China Crisis in Liverpool. Yeah, in Liverpool. You came out around about the same time. There were a lot of bands, a bit of an explosion, like Echo and the Bunny Men, Teardrop Explodes, Flock of Seagulls. Frankie Goes to Hollywood. You were a little bit different in a way because instead of going with that sound, China Crisis crossed a lot of genres. Was that your intention or was that just who you was as a band? Well, we weren't from Liverpool. We were from KB, which is about eight, nine miles outside Sorry, Liverpool. Pal. So we didn't, so that's why we didn't sound like them. And uh, because they all went to school together, you know, Pete Wiley and Ian McClurk and Holly John, all these kinds of people, they more or less went to school and they more or less knew each other. Where when you're a kid like that, 16, 17, going into town, it, it's quite a thing, do you know what I mean? And they were bands and we felt, when we did go to see them, we felt a little bit like we could hear the Doors and we could hear the Velvet Underground and we could hear Bowie and stuff. And Ed and myself, we weren't really interested in sound and like anybody really, not really. I think China Crisis were always, you know, a band with your own unique sound. So you were formed in 1979. Three years later, 1982, you got signed. You brought your debut single out, African and White, and your yep. album came out, which was called Difficult Shapes and Passive Rhythms. Some people think it's fun to entertain. You know, a nice short title for your first album. When you started <laughs> off three <laughs> years previous to that, in Kirby, seven, eight miles out of Liverpool, yep. did you know you were going to end up getting signed? Did you have a feeling that it were going to go, like, we're going to last a long time? We're no, no. We uh, Initially, we were on Inevitable Records, which It's a Material were on, Dead or Alive were on, uh, War Heat were on, and we got African and White House on then. They printed up 3,000 records. And we, me and Ed were like, well, who the fuck's going to buy them? Because there was only me and him and our girlfriends and a couple of mates we had around Kirby. And we really were like, if it ended there, just to make a single was enough, really. That would have been amazing for us, really. It didn't stop there, though. You didn't just make a single. You went from being, like I say, a Liverpool band that were doing your own thing, a Kirby band doing your own thing. Sorry, I'm going <laughs> to stop saying that. You were a band that were doing your own thing, and all of a sudden, you know, you did break, you become part of that 80s explosion, and China Crisis became a household name. Yeah. What was your life like at that moment? Uh, it was all a bit of a shock, really, because... Uh, me and Ed, I keep telling, we're on tour now at the moment, China Crisis, and it, we are doing like all the songs from all the hours, not all the songs from the hours, but it's a retrospective tour. So we do tell people a little bit about what that was like, really, and you know, uh, go on, what was your question again? What was life like <laughs> once you got that single out? How did it uh, Right, so what I've been telling people when we've been on the road is me and Ed didn't need to fucking go anywhere. We were happy as Larry and Kirby with our girlfriends just writing the songs. And when we got signed, I think we'd only done four or five gigs. So when we had to start going to London, uh, we were still writing the first album. And when we went to London, we weren't that impressed, really. And f we were fucking miles away from home. So it was all... We had to get used to sort of everything about it really because we knew nothing about it at all all we were certain of was we absolutely loved writing songs 
and we loved Kirby, really. So to be away from it for months at a time, we did a massive tour with Simple Minds, which went all around Britain, all around Europe, all around America, and it was tough getting used to it, like, it really was. You're busier now than ever, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, yeah. but I want to fast forward 20 years from when you started to 1999 and the tragic death of your drummer, Kevin Wilkinson. Yeah. At that point, you know, did you think there was a future for China Crisis? Well, yeah, because by at that point, if you imagine we'd left Virgin in 1990, and Kevin had been a water boy, he'd been in Squeeze, he'd been in the Proclaimers. He'd been in a lot of bands, he'd hadn't he? He was offered work with Bonnie Ray and stuff, so... He was sort of like, we always, uh, Kevin used to leave the band every time we did an album. When we finished the album, Kevin would always go, I'm getting off. And we were all like, yeah, cool, because uh, uh, he was a bit older than us. And Kevin had this huge amount of experience. And he always had mates that had just got signed in London or, or they'd put a band back together. So really, just having any, any the, the kind of person he was, he was one of those guys that if you were around them, you just felt better kind of thing so yeah it, it was it was an incredible shock really when it, when it all happened it was a tragic part of the band's history but you continued as i mentioned before over the years seven studio albums 20 uk yeah. singles you continued after that you continued to do the tours big 80s tours the 80s festivals and obviously yeah. a lot of work in your own right as well Fast forward to 2019, and earlier this year, you brought yeah. out your own album, your own solo album called Gone From Here. Why have you brought that out as a solo album and not a band album? Well, it was a bit more personal, really. And when you're in a band, the whole thing of being in a band is you have to compromise a bit, and you have to, once you offer something up, there's a whole team of people that make it happen. And I wasn't particularly interested in that, really. I want, I'd want i done that all my life, really. And I wanted to just sort of say something that was nothing to do with anybody else and just sort of myself, really. Sounds a bit selfish, but it's not really. I think after 40 years, it's not selfish to be able to... Yeah, and I, I was wanting to do it years ago, sort of around 2012, 2013, and, uh, and that's when all those crowdfunding... Uh, platforms arrived so every time we were gigging people were saying when are you going to do a record why don't you do a record and me and Ed sort of like I turned around I was on my solo album and I turned around to, and said to Ed you know uh, there's nobody crying out for a Gary Daly record but they really do want a China Crisis record so let's try the pledge platform and if they raise the money and they want us to do it we'll do it and uh, that was a great success for us so then Ed was always of a mind It'd be better if you do it after that, really. It'll, you know, and he's been great about it, really. Absolutely. Great. So your album gone from here, which got released early on in the year. Yeah. How China Crisis fans took to that the fact that you've done this solo record. Yeah, they've been great actually, and oh, it's all around the world, from sort of like Fiji to South America to Norway to Sweden to Germany to Spain to America, and it, I find it fascinating, really, because I'm like. Well, how's that happening? You know, it's like, it's just a little record that's been made in Liverpool. You've not just stopped there, though. There's also been a remix album brought out of it over the last few months. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, the idea was to, basically, I like the idea of collaborating with people. That's the whole, I mean, the whole thing about the album is, is that I've worked with a lot of new people. And then the idea of sort of, fucking about with your music was like always interesting to me so I had friends who in Wave Machines they were a Liverpool band who did two great albums uh, then there was uh, I was put on to a girl from the Deers in Montreal in Canada and she said I want my daughter basically said to me dad one of those this song would make a great uh, French disco kind of song and I didn't know anybody who sang French and I was looking all around Liverpool couldn't find anybody and somebody put me in touch with Natalia from the Deers in Montreal. So I sent her the track, and she would sang it and sent it back, and then we worked on it a bit. And then there, there was a few other people that I was interested in, you know, uh, mixing it. So it's an EP, really. It's about five tracks from the album, and you can stream it and stuff, but it's a bit sort of... I don't like being too involved with it because I, I had nothing to do with it other than ask people, would you like to mess with it? And then when it came back... I was sort of like, oh, that's great, really great, but it's sort of like, it's a thing of its own, really. You know, I wanted all the artists who were involved in it for it to be for them as much as me, really, so that they could go, oh, I got to work with Gary, and, and this is what we did, really. So 
you know, as well as 40 years of China Crisis, your solo album that came out earlier this year, Gary Daly's Gone From Me. I was talking to you before off camera. Yeah. And as a band, as a man, Gary Daly, and as a band, China Crisis, you're busier than ever. Yeah, we've never been so busy. Uh, but we have worked hard. We've really slogged away for the last sort of 10, 15 years. If you imagine when we left, Vir every time we were on Virgin between 81 and 90, the only time we went out and played was to promote a record. So we didn't, so when we were, so we left the label, well, they used to call it drop by back then. So when we were dropped <laughs> by the label, fuckers. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Fuck you know. Uh, we didn't have an audience. I mean, me and Ed were quite relieved actually not to have to, be in it for a while, and we took a few years off where we were writing. But the whole idea of go, we didn't have an audience really. So when we were sort of proper skinned, <laughs> and we were sort of looking at each other, and we were a bit sort of, well, what can we do? It was go and play the songs really that we'd written, and we learned to really love it again. But we didn't have an audience, and we, we were really weird playing fucking SH1T gaffs. And up and down the country, up and down the country, up and down the country. And then the next thing you know, we'd sort of developed into this other kind of band, really, that isn't the same as Go West or, you know, uh, ABC or, or these kind of acts that are quite big, actually. And they still play theatres and stuff. Me and Ed are not really, our, our thing isn't like that, really. I think of it more as sort of, it's a little bit musical now, whereas we have a laugh and... We prefer it a bit smaller than a bit bigger. Although we do play those big 80s festivals. Do you think because you're doing what you want, do you think that's why China Crisis have managed to keep the credibility over the years? Yeah, and I think a lot of it is down to Ed, because uh, he sort of manages the band. And I always sort of credit Ed with keeping the band on the road for all this time, because I'm sort of the no guy, and he's the yet guy, and yet always wins, doesn't it? It's one of those things. Who's saying no? You fuckers, right? Well, you're not with Who's saying yet, yeah, right? Well, that means it gets done, really. So obviously, you've got your solo album out, which you've been busy with, you know, rave reviews and everything. Yeah. Talking to you before, you're touring the world with China Crisis. What does the future hold for Gary Daly and China Crisis? Well, I'm a granddad now. Congratulations. So, uh, which is, uh, I should imagine it's a bit like having permanent number one records kind of thing. So I'm sort of like thinking, I have uh, my granddaughter one day a week. I'm thinking I don't want to get too busy because I want to enjoy all that. And uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't you know. Still where live in no, no. <laughs> we, I do live in Liverpool now. I'm oh, here I'm we go. Come on now, Annie. <laughs> <laughs> You'll me for that. My sister, I was in Kirby this morning. I was picking up my sister and uh, we went to Altrincham Food Market, which was quite nice. Very nice. What did you uh, have for your dinner? Uh, well, do you know what? I was telling me Sister Paula, who still lives in Kirby, I had, uh, we walked around and I was showing her all the stuff and I'm going, that's pizza, they are meat pies. That, I don't know what that is, but it looks a bit Asian or something. And then I saw someone putting out a plate with mushrooms on toast, you know, and, a, and an egg on top of it. And I went, oh, fuck it, I'm going to have that. And then when I sat down with our Paula, I was saying, uh, mushrooms on toast, when did that happen? Because I can remember seeing that for the first time as when we, me and Jean had left home, eh, my missus, and it was, you know, it was still the 80s, and there was a little cafe around the corner, and Jean ordered these mushrooms on toast, and I was like, what the fuck is that, mushrooms? I'd never seen the likes. People it in was Manchester ace. have been having all kinds of mushrooms over the years, honestly. Yeah, I know, I know. I've seen some of them as well, actually. My mate's just been to Wales, and he picked some lovely ones, and he actually showed me the dose you need to take uh, for just a gentle, mild trip kind of thing. They were, they look lovely, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but as I won't well, be having them. <laughs> as well as an amazing back catalogue with China Crisis, like I said before, seven studio albums, sweaty UK singles. Gary Daly's solo album, Gone From Here, is out now. Check it out, get it. It's absolutely brilliant, as is having him on this show tonight. MMTV, please show some absolute respect for the legend it is, Gary Daly of China Crisis. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Cheers. Cheers. Top, top man. And like I say, when MMTV finishes later, make sure you pick up a copy of that record, yeah? Look at that. He's nicking the mic. Scouser. Scouser. <laughs>
MMTV, we are live from Manchester, all around the world on MMTV and Jamazine with High Violet PR and Plugin. It is time for our final live act of the evening. A band who need no introduction whatsoever. MMTV, please welcome, make some noise, the brilliant Suave Masters. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Buenas noches, señoras and señoritas. Buenas Suave Masters. It's our new release. Coming soon, give me a reason. Very much. Uh, big shout out to Anton as well, takes a lot of guts that first time. Fair play. This next one, uh, it's called Tarantino.
you. There we go, the brilliant Suave Martyrs. A massive thank you to Suave Martyrs and, of course, our other live music guests tonight who have been M40 and Ruins. A massive thank you to our guests tonight, Stacey Copeland, Anton and China Christ legend Gary Daly. You have been watching MMTV. We have been live around the world on MMTV and Jamazine in association with High Violet BR and Plugin. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Make sure you share this. Let's get everyone watching it. Rock and Roll TV in Manchester. And don't forget, all of our previous episodes are available on YouTube as well. But thank you for joining us tonight, live from Marley Mancunia Studios in Manchester. Our next edition is two weeks tonight on October the 31st, Halloween, which is also going to be a very, very special edition because it is our first birthday party, one year of MMTV. So make sure you follow us on all the usual social media sites to find out what's going on and how you can be in the studio audience. But thank you for joining us tonight live from Manchester. I've been Dave Sweetmore. We'll see you back here two weeks tonight from all of us here at MMTV. Good night. Thank you.